I bring you greetings in Jesus' name. It's a good evening to be here. I was noticing the banners you have on the wall over there. They basically tell the whole story. When Alex called me and told me that the topic that they wanted me to talk about is the resurrection. And I'm like, okay, so the gospel has to include the resurrection or it's not the gospel. I mean, the good news is that Jesus is not dead. If Jesus' bones are rotting somewhere in the Middle East, you might as well go home and you might as well quit planting lily flowers and all the stuff we do for Easter because it's worthless. But if the resurrection of Jesus helps us to understand he's our redeemer, he's our justifier, he's our sanctifier, Christ was raised from the dead, the first and only sacrifice that God was pleased with. When you read the stories of Solomon when he dedicated the temple, how many thousands and thousands of animals were killed in that, you know, to dedicate the temple. And yet, God was not really pleased with all those sacrifices. When you get to the, well, like in the Jewish Bible, it ends with Second Chronicles. And it ends with the words, there is no remedy. When you look at our, our Bibles, the English Bibles, it ends in Malachi. Malachi says, God says, just close the doors. Stop doing these useless sacrifices on my altar. They were going through the motions. I mean, I really like what Alex had to say because we have made the gospel just going through a couple steps, signing your name or raising your hand or saying a prayer, and everybody goes back and says, well, I'm not sure, I'm just not sure if I'm going to go to heaven when I die. When people do that to me, I'm like, Let, let's don't go back to what you thought you did. Why don't we just do it right now? and do it right from here on. Then you can always say, yes, I, I, I did that. I understood that. I didn't. Somebody says, well, I found Jesus. I'm sorry, he wasn't lost. The problem is he found us. And he found us in a, a terrible, sinful state. When, when you look at the resurrection and, and you find out that the Bible says there were 500 eyewitnesses. You know, if you took that to the courtroom and you had 500 eyewitnesses, the, the judge would throw it out because there, there's no use going any farther because you have that many witnesses. You didn't just have one or two. Something is established in the Bible at the mouth of two or three witnesses. He had 500 plus all the women and the, the disciples and everyone else. So if you start to look at the eyewitnesses, then you say, oh, okay, so it's pretty big. Just like Alex was saying, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 10, I'm not going to read it, but there's a phrase in there that you have to catch every time you read it, and it's according to the scriptures. It's always according to the scriptures. It's not revelation that I get from God. I can have revelation of the truth of the scriptures, but there isn't any more being written it. Job, which is probably the oldest book in the Bible, Job 19, 25, and 26, says, My Redeemer lives, though my skin is destroyed, yet I will see God. Job believed in the resurrection, both of Jesus and of himself. John 11 is the story of Mary and Martha. They both, they both said, if you would have been here, our brother would live. Both of them said it. Martha, I believe it was, said, I, Jesus said, do you believe he will raise again? And she said exactly what a good Jew would say. I believe that in the last days he will be raised. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am. Jesus wanted the focus. He, God's plan from eternity past you know, there's an interesting verse in the Bible that says Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. 
Now, how can that be if he was crucified like 4,000 years after the foundation of the world? Because God is not controlled by time. And what God plans or what God says at the beginning is as good as, it, as if it had already happened at that moment. It's that true. When you look at Daniel, Daniel 12, 2 and 3, those who sleep will awake. Okay, what are the results of the cross? If we want to talk about the cross, and we're, I'm going to go kind of backwards here. The results of the cross, we, we say the, the word redemption for us. We, we look back and we say, well, the, the cross is redemption. That's great. It means to purchase. Okay. When we talk about theology, that's the study of God. When we talk about doxology, that's the worship of God. We've got to get both right. Salvation, that word simply means deliverance. That's why you read in the Old Testament, it talks about they were delivered from such and such, or salvation came to this, or salvation came to that. It means deliverance. Now, these are all the things that happened because of the cross. Redemption is deliverance from the bondage of sin by a price paid. Justification, I was guilty, but I was declared righteous. Forgiveness, I had a debt, and the debt was canceled. Reconciled, I was an enemy of God, but I was made a friend. And then it uses some other words. We're adopted. I, I'm, I, you know, this thing of adoption, we think of adopting a little baby, but adoption in the Bible, you're adopted as an adult with all the rights and privileges that go with being part of the family. Okay, now, I was a sinner, I was a slave. And I was set free to answer the call of God. When Alex was speaking about the scriptures and how important it is to put your belief in the scriptures, it's kind of like saying the same thing both ways. Jesus is the word and the word is, I mean, this is Jesus on paper. When you look at, <clears throat> excuse me, when you look at what this is to accept or to believe or to trust in Jesus. Now, you have some other things. You, you, you trust in the word of God, but then that puts you in a position with a new heart to answer the call of God. We have other words like we've been ransomed or we've been delivered. I can give you some references. Matthew 20, 28, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. And then if you're looking at the words and you want to say, okay, so when, okay, well, the Bible says today is the day of salvation, but that deliverance or that forgiveness comes and it, it, it forgives us of our past sins, right? And it forgives us of our present sins. What about future sins? There's a verb tense in, in this. It's called perisphrastic perfect, if you want to be real technical. And it means when Jesus died on the cross, what he did reached back before time. And it reaches as far this way till time is no more. Tell me about the grace of God. If you could stand under Niagara Falls, you might get some idea of what the grace of God would be like. It's too much to describe. It's too much to, uh, uh, to understand. But this, this word that is so special in the Bible about us being purchased, there's two words. Purchased from the marketplace. That's used again and again and again in the Bible. That's what the word means. To be redeemed. But there's another word. It means, and, and if you want the where it's found, it's in Galatians 3.13. And it's purchased from the marketplace, never to be resold again. Now, please tell me, how secure are you in your salvation, in your redemption? How secure? But there's another piece. We are purchased or ransomed 
or bought back for God's own use, guess what? Forever, far as it can go. Let me ask you again, how secure? How secure are we? How secure am I? I have lots of other examples, but time's going to get away. Main part of what I want to talk about tonight has to do with a little quick trip starting in, in uh, Matthew 21. We know it as Palm Sunday. If you listen to a lot of the theologians, they will say that Palm Sunday was the beginning of Passion Week, and Passion Week is the week that they used to check the lambs, the lambs that were brought in to be sacrificed. They would look at those lambs to make sure they were perfect. Jesus, when he rode into Jerusalem that day, he was presenting himself. But guess what? He had a ministry for three and a half years where he presented himself every day. He said when they came to arrest him, I was with you every day in the temple. Did they have him, I mean, did they listen to what he had to say? Did they believe him at all? Okay, let's just do this, like I said, kind of a quick trip. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 21 of Matthew says, And when they had approached the Jerusalem and had come to Bethanage in the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent his two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village and opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says something to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them with you. And this took place that what was spoken of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Okay, now listen. There's two donkeys. There's the mother donkey and the colt. And it was, he said, we have need of them. And the guy sent them both. Why two donkeys? I don't preach very good sermons. I do Bible studies. But why two donkeys? Let me, let me take you back. Let me take you back to, um, let's see, I give you a, a reference. It would be in, in uh, Genesis 41, 43. Now, this is when Joseph was finally recognized as the guy that is supposed to be in charge of all of Egypt. And it said there were two chariots. Joseph rode in the second chariot, and who was in the first chariot? Pharaoh, right? Okay, and it says that when they went past, they would shout, bow the knee. To who, Pharaoh or Joseph? Joseph, right? Because he's going to be in charge now of all the people. When Abraham and Isaac are walking up the mountain, you have a point where Isaac looks at Abraham and he says, okay, here's the fire and here's the wood. Where's the sacrifice? What does he say? God will provide himself a sacrifice or a lamb. Okay. The next phrase, and the two of them walked on together. Let me ask you, who's riding the first donkey? If Jesus is riding the second donkey, and if you want, an, if you want a reference for why they're doing this thing with the, the palm branches and the, their coats and everything, it's in 2 Kings 9.13, and it's, it's Jehu, when, like when the battle like when he's going to go into battle or when, he's, when the victory's won, this is what they do. They lay their clothes on the ground and they get palm branches. It's all symbolic, every bit of it. How can, by the way, who's riding the first donkey? Okay. How can two groups of people look at the same Jesus? One group prays him and the other group kills him, wants to kill him. One group sees all the good and wonderful things, and the other group sees nothing but a lawbreaker. In Luke 15, 2, it says that he, they grumbled because he sat and ate with tax gatherers and sinners. It says they came near him. 
You know what that phrase means? They enjoyed his company. Now tell me, why did the tax gatherers and sinners enjoy Jesus' company? Hmm? <laughs> Anybody? Why did, why did they enjoy his company? He never condemned them. They already knew what was wrong. It's the first time a rabbi or a teacher cared anything about them. Okay. When you look at the, you know, this, this story and you say, okay, I'm going to start with verse 6. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid them their garments on, on which he sat. And most of the multitude spread their garments on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. And the multitude was going before him, and those who followed were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? Now remember, he's been in the temple almost every day. He's been teaching somewhere every day. Why are they saying, who is this? When the disciples were in the boat and there's this big storm come up and Jesus is asleep. And he gets up and rebukes the storm and it became perfectly still. What was their response? Who is this? that even the wind and the waves obey him. It's not uncommon to say, who is this, when they can't comprehend what he's doing. Okay, so, oh, by the way, who was sitting on the first donkey? Mm -hmm. They couldn't see him, right? Answers in back of me here. Okay, then he says this. And the multitudes were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now he's going right back to where he was every day teaching. And he entered the temple and cast out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and, and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves. The first time he said that in John chapter 1 or 2, 1, he said, my father's house. This one he said, my house. What's the difference? Why is it he started with his ministry saying, my father's house? This time, when he cleansed the temple, he said, my house. If you want to know what aggravated people so bad, it wasn't just the fact that the money is scattered all over the floor. It isn't that all the livestock is turned loose. You see, by rights, every person was supposed to bring a lamb, every family. And if they bring a lamb... And they're all coming on a certain day. What does it look like in Israel? It doesn't matter which direction from Jerusalem you, you look or you have a road. Everybody's coming bringing a lamb. If you're a stranger in Jerusalem, you would say, what is this? Why everybody with their kids and everything are coming and they're all bringing a lamb? That's called a wide open door for ministry. When people ask questions, why this? When Jesus did what he did by cleansing the temple, he's not just saying that you've made this a flea market. He's saying that what my father's house was back then, my house is now, I wouldn't put up with it in his house, and I won't put up with it in my house. How about you and me? 
What do we put up with? How do we put up with what we put up with? Or are there, there are things that we say, okay, there is a limit. This is as far as it, this is it. We're not doing this anymore. When Jesus did it here, he's going to, and I remember, this is his last week of ministry. And the temple is being used for a flea market. And when it says, um, he overturned the tables of money and the seats of those who were selling doves. What, why the selling of doves is so terribly important? A dove is something that you could bring or buy as a sacrifice if you were too poor for anything else. It would just be a couple coins. Jesus is trying to tell them, you don't need any of this. Where is this taking place? It's taking place in the outer court. Listen to this next verse. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Why was he so upset with the way they were treating his house? Because he had made a place in his house for all the nobodies. There's a song, and I don't remember the name of it. It's pretty popular right now. And the one little phrase says, on the sign it says, come as you are. And then the response is, I doubt it. When Jesus did this, the money on the floor isn't important. The doves that he turned loose are not important. What's important that day standing in the courtroom? I mean, the, the outer court. Who? Say it. The, the most important thing there is Jesus, right? And guess what he's going to do? He's going to do the same thing in his house that he did every day in the villages. When it says the blind and the lame came and he healed them, they didn't care about the money on the floor. In the middle of the worst disaster in religion, Jesus shows up and fixes everything for those who need fixing. Those that the blind and the lame came because they had a need. In Mary's song, in I think it's Luke, she says that the poor have come and they'll be filled. But the rich, the home empty. the poor. I would contend that everybody in this group is in the top 10% of all the wage earners in the entire world. Seventy-five percent of the people in the world live on less than seventy-five dollars a year. We have a lot of things to be thankful for. Listen to this, verse 15. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things he had done, they saw what he did, right? They, it even says wonderful things. What wonderful things? That he cleaned up the temple or made it a mess? What wonderful things? The blind and the lame. Things that he had done, and children who were crying in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant. How in the world do you put those two thoughts together? That's like a crash. It's like, okay, the wonderful things he did, and they were upset. And he said, and, and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes? Thou will prepare praise for thyself. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany to lodge there. <coughs> Excuse me. When you think of what Jesus did, he did it and the common people came to him. 
That's who came to John the Baptist. When you find out that a worship center has become a marketplace, you know there's something seriously wrong. When Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, he said it's not in this mountain or in Jerusalem, but those that worship must worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for those are who the Father is looking for. And who is he talking to? A woman that had been, been married five times and her, who she was living with wasn't her husband. And she said, I perceive your prophet. And she said, I know when Messiah comes. We get really caught up in things like seeker-friendly churches, places where people meet and understand, and <clears throat> they, they find, try to find a place where worship is pleasing to God. And what they're actually saying is the worship is pleasing to them. I like the way they pray. I like their kind of music. Okay, now if we would just do this, and I, I'm not going to labor this too long, but you can do all this out of the book of Ephesians, most of it in chapter 2. You can say he is risen, but is our life any different? I mean, we sing about it and we have nice banners, and, but is our life different because he's risen? You've probably heard me say this before, but if God put all the good out of seven billion people into one person, there would not be enough good to get to God. So we have kind of a dilemma. The other part of this is that if you're what you've always been, you're probably not a Christian. It's a wonderful thing that Jesus died on the cross and paid the sin debt. But without the resurrection, there is absolutely no new life. He died for what I've done. He was raised from the dead to take the place of what I am. He died for what I've done. But he was raised from the dead to take the place of what I am. There's only ever been one Christian life ever lived, and that was him. And he wants to live that through you and me. What the Bible says is our problem. We are dead in our sinful state, and we are of no use to God. This is a statement that is made many times, and that is like we take broken things and throw them away. God takes unbroken things and set them aside and says they're not useful. There is no degrees in death. Dead is dead. Follow the ways of the world, and we're under the command of Satan. What are the ways of the world? I'm not going to read it, but you can read uh, Galatians 5, 16 through 21. Choosing my own way and caring nothing for God's will or God's ways, do my thoughts and my actions satisfy me, or are they centered on the word of God? There is a spirit of selfishness and rebellion that lives inside every one of us. We can believe and worship most anything. And it's okay until you talk about the Bible or talk about Jesus. Romans 3.23 said, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the Jew and the Gentile. The way the book of Romans is set up, the first chapter is about the ungodly man, the, the absolute nobody. And he basically says, I should be acquitted based on the fact that I don't know anything. The second person that's brought up is the Jew. And he says, well, I should be acquitted based on the fact that we have the scriptures and we have all the promises of God. The third one. That's us. That's the one that knows to do right and doesn't do it. It's all sin. Romans 11.32 says, For God has shut up all in disobedience that he may show mercy to some, a few, how many? 
all. That includes you and me. The, the world attacks us in, in two ways. Well, from the outside, it's the world, the flesh, and the devil. From the inside, it's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It is the natural man, and we start from there. But verse 4 does this. Now, let me. It starts out and it says, but God. Well, I said something wrong. Anyway, I'll, I'll do it with this. I, I, I can do it from memory. It says, but God, being rich in mercy. Now, remember, he shut all under disobedience that he may show mercy to all. Does that mean everybody's going to get saved? No. But what it does mean that everybody could be. But more, more mercy more than we can ask or think. You know, when you think about mercy, I mean, when God rescues us from our miserable condition, that is the shortest definition of mercy you can have. And it says God's mercies are new every morning. Do you know why? Because that's how often we need them. You know, you can stand on neutral ground. That means you're not a Christian, you're not a Buddhist, you're not a Muslim, you're standing just on neutral ground. And people like to say, you know, with that kind of, with that kind of a position, I can choose anything I want. Really? You can choose anything you want till it comes to being a Christian. You can be a Muslim. You can be a Hindu. You can be a Buddhist. All you have to do is start practicing whatever they tell you to practice. What does it take to be a Christian? What's the second banner up there? Why does it have a butterfly on it? That butterfly represents something we call metamorphosis. That butterfly used to be a willy worm. And it couldn't fly when it was a willy worm. And every, everything that butterfly looked at was from ground level. But through the process of metamorphosis, the willy worm turned into a butterfly. Now tell me what his perspective is on everything that's down there. I used to only see this, this, and this. That's the natural man. The Christian that has a new heart, has been made brand new, has been born again. I don't care what words you use. Come to a knowledge of the truth. That's what I have to use when I'm with the Amish culture. You can't say, you can't say save. They, they'll throw you out. But I can say come to a knowledge of the truth. That's when the butterfly shows up. Has it ever been possible for a butterfly to turn back into a willy worm? I'm glad some of you said no. It, it's just not possible. Remember I started with that little phrase, but God. Not politics, not culture, not military strength, not the economy, not education, not even religion, but God. That's where mercy comes from. Only God. When God chooses us by allowing his mercy to flow to us and we realize what we really are, that's that willy worm that has no perspective on anything. You know, when Jesus said to go in the closet and close the door, he was actually talking about that, that butterfly. A Jewish dad would take his uh, prayer shawl 
and wrap his kids up in it, and he'd pray for them for the hope of transformation. We were dead in sins, but made alive together with Christ. God did all this on our behalf, and I had to do nothing. If I had something in my redemption, my salvation, my justification, if I had something in it, I can undo it. But since I didn't, and when you look at, truly look at the, the resurrection, you've heard plenty of sermons about doubting Thomas. In your mind, please change that to most honest Thomas. I think that Gideon in the Old Testament is the most honest prophet because he didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. That's being honest. When you take Doubting Thomas and you realize that when, he came, when they came to him and said, Jesus is alive, now these are the other disciples. They didn't believe the women. That's normal. But when it come to the other disciples, he surely should have believed them, right? But it says when he came to them first, Thomas wasn't there. And what does it say right away? He showed them his hands and his feet. So why do we beat up Thomas? Because he says, I won't believe unless I put my fingers in the nail prints, put my hand in his side. Always up till then, you're touching the hem of his garment. That's the, that's the phrase that everybody uses in the Gospels. When Jesus comes and Thomas is there, he says, here, touch me. Not the hem of my garment. That's Old Testament. This new way of living is touch me. Did Thomas believe? You see, when they nailed Jesus to the cross, or they nailed any other thief or whatever the criminal was, you nail their hands and their feet. Why? Because you want to stop what they do, and you want to stop where they go. Did it stop Jesus? Three days. Till everything was finished. And the price had been paid. The father had accepted the payment. The Bible says that God was pleased with the sacrifice. So you serve a very satisfied God. Your only way to him, though, is through Jesus. When he held out his hands to Thomas, Thomas's end response was, my Lord and my God. In other words, he just put two things together. My Lord and my God. One's the one that's to be believed and the other one's the one that's to be obeyed. And Jesus' response to him was, you believe because you see. Blessed are those who believe who have not seen. Who's that? You and me. Let's pray.